other day, I was taking a hike with my seven-year-old daughter, and she asked me a humdinger of a question. She said, Mommy, what, is, what does nature mean? What is, what is nature? Now, you know, that's a pretty straightforward question, but it's pretty difficult to answer. I mean, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it takes paragraphs to answer this term, to, to define the term. And, and so it got me thinking. Nature must mean many things to many different people. For, for some, nature is a pristine wilderness where the hand of man has never set foot. For others, it's any wild thing in our midst. For many, it was a, came packaged as a television show brought to you by Atlantic Richfield and viewers like you. And of course, we cannot deny the incredibly powerful call of nature. But really, what, what is nature? The traditional view of a, of a place devoid of human impact is really no longer functional. We have changed the planet's climate. So we, there's no place on Earth free of our impact. So how do we define nature in modern times. Well, of course, this is not what my daughter wanted to hear. Mommy takes too long to answer questions. <laughs> but this question lingered with me, and in a sense, it's defined my somewhat eclectic career path. Because if you can understand the deep meaning of nature for people, then you can work to better conserve our limited natural resources. So for me, as a little girl, I define nature as the ultimate playground. If you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said, I want to be outside. Um, and now in college and graduate school, that playground transformed into a workshop and a laboratory for understanding and all of nature's intimate connections and intricacies. But you really can't work in the ocean world, which is my focus, without paying heed to the tremendous impacts that we're having on the marine environment. So now much more of my time is spent working in conservation. And I've gleaned insight from a great deal, many, dif many disciplines um, in doing this work. And one of my favorites is from bioeconomists who define nature in terms of natural capital. So all of nature's ecosystem services can get a line item in a spreadsheet. For example, pollinators provide about 160 to $190 billion worth of services to our agricultural economy. And our world ocean is providing over $80 billion worth of fish every year, not to mention the livelihood of 300 million people and food security for a billion more. Now, this is a powerful definition of nature and, and, and one of my favorites, but I've found for a lot of people, the numbers just don't do it. After a few million, million, they just tend to tune out. Why is that? Well, it may have something to do with the fact that there's a lot more going on in our brains below our number-crunching consciousness than, than we realize. In fact, 98% of our brain activity is dedicated to subconscious processing. And our subconscious is humming along at an incredible rate, about 11 million bits per second, compared to our paltry subconscious at about, um, our paltry consciousness at about 50 bits per second. So you can kind of compare that to the discharge of the Chicago River compared to what's coming out of your kitchen faucet, your subconscious versus your consciousness. Big discrepancy there. So this got me thinking, we need, to, we need more than numbers. We need to, to spark the subconscious and the conscious simultaneously to message conservation. And to do this, I have become more and more interested in combining science and art. And I've gleaned some insight along the way and some lessons that I, I hope you two might find useful. The first is the importance of story. We humans are wired for story. We learn best through story. We love cause and effect. We love a good narrative through line and, and, a, and a plot. And um, Uri Hassan of, of Princeton, a neurologist at Princeton, has said, a story is the only way to activate multiple parts of our brain simultaneously so that the listener actually takes what they're hearing and turns it into their own ideas and own experiences. It's that, that, that storyteller-listener mind meld. So story is really important. 
Now, framing is also incredibly important. Think of the frame as a sturdy little boat that's going to carry your story deep into the motivational and emotional reaches of your brain. Now, not all stories are, um, not all frames are, um, are helpful. Some are counterproductive, like for instance, the fear frame or the crisis frame, which is so often invoked by environmentalists who are relentlessly hawking the apocalypse. And this kind of framing can cause the, the, the audience to actually furl inward and close, close down, give up. We found that a much more empowering frame is the global interconnectivity, that we're all in this together, that big planetary processes are actually connected to individual experiences. And I'm going to show you a clip from a series that I worked on with National Geographic called Strange Days on Planet Earth, where we connect climate change to health issues in Jamaica by tracing the world. Emerging is this amazing picture of global connections where one part of the globe can be connected to another thousands of miles away. The complexity and the large scale linkages that are global um, that are involved in this entire process are mind boggling to me. The warming of the Indian Ocean and then how that affects the North Atlantic Oscillation and that affects how the dust gets mobilized in the Sahara. Then you get a lot of dust in the air, then blown over to the Caribbean. I think the and so there we connect um, climate change all the way across the planet. And we're all in this together. And this, you not only learn more about how nature works, but you also, this is more inclusive. To solve this problem, we have to reach outward. We have to work together as a species. So a much more informative kind of frame. Another le lesson than that I've learned along the way is how important it is to get the right messenger to carry your story. Um, a credible, trusted messenger. And I'm going to show you a clip from a series that I'm working on right now for TED Ed called Stories from the Sea, where we've chosen as our messengers no, no human messengers in this series. How did I get here? Well, it's a stranger story than you might think. I came from a world of drifters, a place few humans have ever seen. The world of plankton. I came from a batch of a million eggs, and only a few of us survived. When I became a larva, I moved among other drifters. My fellow plankton came in all sizes, from tiny algae and bacteria to animals longer than a blue whale. Here among the plankton, the food web is so tangled and complex, even scientists don't know who eats whom. But I do. <laughs> At least now you know a bit of my story. There's so much more to me than just a tasty meal. And you can watch that whole, the whole film on TED Ed, so you might want to check that out. Um, so we've got stories, we've got framing, we've got messengers. The next really important lesson I learned was the power of empathy, perhaps the most important lesson. And I learned this by collaborating, um, I learned this most powerfully by collaborating with an incredible dance troupe called Capacitor out of um, San Francisco on a piece called Okeanos. And I liken this to Cirque du Soleil meets the ocean. We had live vocalists and contortionists and acrobats and, and um, incredible underwater video footage. Um, and each one of the, an of the dancers became an animal. And, and you, could, you could just be in there with them. So I'm going to show you. Imagine for a moment that you are a big, powerful, muscular fish, and you're plying the open sea, and you've just been caught. Since 1950 and the advent of industrialized fishing, we've lost 90% of our big fishes. Our commercial fish stocks are being devastated with millions of lines in the water, 
Will we only stop after we've caught the very last fish? small clip but that single dancer that single fish on stage is enough to portray the the incredible impoverishment happening to the world ocean due to our in part to our overfishing so um, so you know the much more of our brain is dedicated to movement than to language and dance was possibly the the first way that we had of bonding and communicating long before we had language skills so it's also an incredibly powerful tool for getting into the subconscious I'm going to um, close with a, a final project that I'm working on with a, an amazing tree biologist and TED speaker, Nalini Nadkarni, who among her many projects also works in the US prison system. Now this is a system where we incarcerate more people than any other, other country in the world. And we have about 50% um, repeat offenders. It's also about as divorced from nature as you can possibly be, extreme nature deprivation. It kind of makes you wonder if that kind of separation from Earth's green and blue is actually helping to rehabilitate these people or is working to make them more hardened, violent, and unstable. Why not bring nature imagery into prisons? Pictures of trees, ocean, and streams to, to bring about better psychological and emotional health and at, at the very least, reduce violence in the prison. Well, Nalini gave a talk in 2010 suggesting such an idea, and a warden in Oregon saw it and said, let's give it a go. And it, things take a long time in prison to get going, but we've just started this, and the results are incredibly promising. And maybe I can come back in next year or something and, and, and report on some of the data we're gathering. But early stages yet, but really exciting. So. How, how are we doing on our definition of, of nature? Where are we? Um, we've got with the tools that we've learned to help convey the importance of nature and all the different ways that we see it. It affects us in, in, even in prison as perhaps a pathway to inner peace. How are we doing on defining it? Well, I think we still have a ways to go. But we're making steady headway. And we are. But what we need are more voices. We need your voices. We need a billion voices. We need seven billion voices for nature. Because in this instance, the numbers really do matter. And with that, I'll leave you with one thought. Four billion years ago, our ocean conjured life. And from these humble, single-celled origins, a strange, sentient being emerged with the capacity to investigate the world like never before. A species with the ability to sing, to dance, to write music, poetry, code machines, create films that captured the world in, in all its beauty and complexity. We humans are the first species able to consciously record, archive, and give voice to nature with spectacular clarity. Could it be that the emergence of humanity is nature's way of defining itself? Well, if that be the case, I can think of no greater honor bestowed upon any species than to investigate, celebrate, give voice to, and nurture with every ounce of our creative and scientific energy this exquisite entity we call nature. Thank you.